uh, joking that like we have Lemon in the house. Brooklyn is in the house today. Um, Lemon is here via Montana, but originally from the New York and in, in Brooklyn specifically. And I mean, there are so many things that I wrote down. I mean, he just embodies so much of performance in so many ways. Actor, poet, writer, dancer, playwright, performer. I mean, the list goes on and on, and we'll learn a lot today about who he is and, and, uh, and what he does and all those things, so stay tuned for that. Um, some accomplishments that I just wanted you to know about. Um, many of you probably have read some of the things, but um, he was involved with Deaf Poetry Jam and was one of the most popular performers on that. Tony Award winner, has performed at the Apollo Theater, Chicago Theater, Kodak Theater, was involved with Live 8 in Philadelphia, um, was a Barishnikov Arts Center scholar, has appeared in movies, has worked with Spike Lee, has projects with uh, Netflix, HBO, so many others. Uh, multiple theater credits, including his one-man show, County of Kings, um, which, you, which also embodies the book and the text in that. Um, he's done so many te teaching workshops, Harvard, Princeton. I mean, oh my gosh, we're so lucky to have him here today. So that gives you a little taste, but it's time to hear from him. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage, Lemon Anderson. <sighs> Deep down, there is an old man by the river Blue denim in his flow. If Martha's Vineyard had a stepchild, I would be there with the rusty picket fence glow. Desert sand to a black beach springer. Ghetto Shakespearean clown. Little shop a horror fanatic daydreaming of beautiful girls from Skid Row with black eyes singing downtown. New Eureka exile. Frozen Japan kicks. Jordan stacked next to a collection of homies locked up posing for Polaroid flicks. Suffering from visions of grandeur, sucking the success out of pain, staring at dirty napkins, seeing the art in a coffee stain, cradle to the grave, distant coolness, red wine emo, 730 rudeness, south side outlaw, flying cut sleeves, 80 blocks from Tiffany's on heavy rotated, YouTube bleeds blood flooded with anti-social justice, sniffing gunpowder out of the peril of a propaganda musket, immediate descendant of the cool Vietnam draft, Boricua mixed with Lower East Side heroin, resulted in the aftermath. I'm from the house of Step It, Fetch It, Burnt Down, lyricist lounge, poet laureate of the old Hop underground, son of drama, child of the bard, an English soldier at Agincourt, either die or go hard, kill or be martyred. I am big pantameter on the regular, so the gift goes farther. An Aristotle thug, dealing with the real, Plato is the enemy of the soul like a Def Jam deal. Watch me. And my 1983 Bop G, New York City's son of LQ's unit square in the Roxy's watch. How these American idol Simons try to stop me, hate me when I walk through the door, love me when I blow up the spot, please, when they first see me. They never take me serious till they find out my talent don't come from the color of my skin, but from my wholehearted experience to so watch me. Me and my story, how I lived it. If you were my mother, every morning I'll be walking you to the methadone clinic. My older brother's in Iraq, killing corner store robs. America, I don't forgive it. So watch me deal with the ridicule and shame, the worst heartache and pain. And how I maintained was by turning myself into the king of the poetry spit fame. Watch me turn my pennies into dimes, my darkness into shine, many of my mistakes into nailing it forever. One time, watch me make love to hard work ethics, because game without ambition is game never respected. These are not words, these are my blood, sweat, and tears from the real side of Franklin County to the Sunset Park Piers. And my homies in the prison yard still finishing their years, because I'm an ex-con, but an ex-con has always been a friend of me. Don't discriminate, because it was written that even Jesus had a felony, so watch me be the artist who was born ready-made. Watch me take my lemons and make the best goddamn lemonade. Thank you. 
Bouton. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, Good. please have a seat. I know we'll have more, more of that coming. All right. Thank you. This is great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> That's cool, right? <laughs> um, so I'd like to start out with a question that I know you get asked all the time. Sure. And people have been telling me, oh my gosh, he has such a cool name. Cool. And so yeah. can you tell us the story about your name? Yeah. So my brothers are 100% Puerto Rican, and they're also brown Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. And my father's Norwegian. So I came out really blonde and white, and I had a really fairly large head. I had this head, but in a little body. So... <laughs> They called me Lemonhead when I was young. And then I met them halfway. I said, look, can we just take the head out? Just call me Lemon and <laughs> this will work out. And eventually everyone just called me Lemon. But my real name is Andrew. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and as a performer, do you feel that those are two different personas, Lemon and Andrew? Or are they completely merged? No, Andrew doesn't exist anymore, really. Only mm -hmm. like on paper when a cop pulls me over and I have to give him my license. <laughs> it's just like, well, I'm Andrew. I can't tell him my name is Lemon. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, usually paperwork, I don't really identify what, what Andrew means. I don't, mm. like, it was only used in school. Even in school, my teachers called me Lemon. Yeah. Uh, I was Lemon for a long time, and I wasn't Anderson, but I wanted to honor my father. Yeah. As I started to mature as an artist, I felt like, you know, Anderson was good. It felt great. Yeah. It also is an opportunity to kind of change you know, it was, I guess it was a psyche thing. I kind of psyched myself out and said, all right, maybe I'm not a lemon anymore. I'm Lemon Anderson. Mm, great. And it worked out. And I know we're going to talk about that. This, the way we, we've been talking a lot the last couple of days about sort of how to structure mm -hmm. this. And, and, and Lemon, in, your, in his generosity, was just said, you know, I don't want to just get up and talk about myself. I, don't want, I really want to be what you guys need or, or what you would like to hear. And so we started talking about some topics that might be, you know, important or interesting um, and so he sort of has let this evolve into this sort of extended interview type session and then we're going to mix and match mix in some performance along with it and hit some themes that that I that are really compelling to me in mm -hmm. your work and in our conversation so the first thing I kind of like to go at is is um, success and sure. hard work mm -hmm. um, that's something that I've seen in your in your work a lot and and that you've talked about even just now you mm -hmm. mentioned work ethic and hard work um, um, what 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 is success to you right now? I, I have children, so for a long time I, I thought you had to be successful in order to be happy. Mm. And my child once told me that I put too much pressure on her about being successful. Mm. And I learned from her, right? I, I had no idea because, you know, I worked really hard so she didn't have to repeat what I had to go through as a young man or as a kid. Um, and success... You know, it's like this. You have to just love the process because the results don't belong to you. Yeah. You know, you just got to work. And you got to love to work or you got to fall in love with working. It's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. And you got to make that relationship work. It's your partner. Yeah. The process. The results don't belong to you because you can have a really great show that no one wants to come see. I know the feeling. Yeah. You can have a really successful idea that no one wants to buy. But you just created it, and that's just, you know that's the real success, the process. You have to fall in love with the process. It took a while to learn that. And that's what I was going to. Lucky gonna, you, you guys. Get yeah, to I was going to ask you that. Was it uh, was that something that hit you all in one fell swoop, or is, did that evolve that concept of falling in love with it? How did you come to that realization? I was tired of being talented. Oh. I was just like super talented, and everyone called me talented, but I didn't have a body of work. And I felt that the, the, the artists that I respect and look up to had a body of work and they weren't talented. You know, they weren't the cool guys. Mm. They were just the guys who had uh, like projects. Yeah. Uh, and this started happening after deaf poetry when, you know, we were given this opportunity to be on a major stage and have a great platform like HBO for so long. But it really didn't define true work. When I looked behind the camera and there was the camera guy, the DP, the second AD, the lighting guy, the sound guy. And those guys had long careers. And I wanted that. Mm -hmm. I wanted this thing to last forever. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so I started to pull back a little bit. And I was taught 
I took Shakespeare. Uh, what, yeah, we'll talk about that. But I, I just learned that what is it that I want? Do I want to be talented or do I want to be just working? And I fell in love with like, yo, know, the process. Like, I just want to be working. In order to work, you have to put out work. You have to have specs and people have to see your work instead of who you are. Mm. Because who you are is going to pretty much fade away, you know, what all art, what, you know, artists. I think we define great musicians by a body of work and not just one job. Right. So. That, that's, I think that's amazing. I like yeah. that a lot. Uh, looking through the lens of this audience, we have, you know, students here, faculty here, community members here. Yeah. What advice do you have, if any, for them on how to f fall in love with the process or how to fall in love or find that? Is there anything we can do to help yeah. each other? Sure. Yeah. I, I, this has to be a lifestyle for you, right? You know, your work, your dreams. First of all, your dreams, be careful who you share them with. That's first, right? You know, you Why have, do you say that? Because you, you might be really ambitious and no one will understand. Like, you know, my uncles and my family didn't understand that I wanted to always be on stage. They, they didn't get it. Like, uh, it's, not someone any, it's not something anyone did in my family. Uh, so I had to be real careful in sharing that. And then I had to make a lifestyle out of it. That's the point. I had to be around other artists who were doing it every day. And that's all I, all I wanted to be around. And then the lifestyle really started to shape the artist of Lemon and not Lemon from the hood or nothing like that. It was like, oh, Lemon really knows his work, right? So some of the artists that I started to hang around with and make a lifestyle with uh, were great readers, great, you know, they studied great poets. And instead of just writing poetry, I actually studied poetry. Yeah. And when you study, like a great musician, a great musician is uh, an accumulation of other musicians. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. they define their own style. Right. Uh, and I was really su successful because of that in all of the projects that I worked on. I've always had a great history of, like, the work I do, right? Mm -hmm. So... And still now, to this day, I was just in Montana building a new solo show. And I was able to see all the new poems that I'm writing with poets behind them. You know, it was like yeah. Sekou Sindiata was here. You know, E.K. was there. Willie Perdomo was here. I started to see other poets in the poems. And that, that was helpful for me in not having writer's block. Yeah. You know, just to steal from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To go along that, I mean, I think that's a beautiful concept to think about, to surround yourself with people who mm -hmm. are doing it to develop that lifestyle. That's something you did a lot in the beginning. Yeah, uh, that's how I got into the deaf poetry. You industry. sort yeah. of really, like, doggedly followed some, some mentors or yeah. some leaders. And can you talk about that experience and, and mm -hmm. that, that opening, again, through the lens of, you know, hoping to inspire some people here to maybe sure. think about doing that for themselves, too? Yeah, so... I really didn't have a lot of poems. I just knew a lot of poems that were written by other poets. Mm -hmm. uh, and that came because I met a man named Reggie Gaines who had won a Tony Award as a spoken word artist. And I thought, wow, that, how do you do that, yeah. right? Most of the spoken word artists I knew, let me just move to the side so I don't have my back turned to you guys. Uh, most of the spoken word artists I knew were just slamming poetry uh, on Friday nights and they would compete against each other. And I, wasn't, I was too sensitive for competition, uh -huh. at least at that point. You know, I just, and I knew they were tricking their poems to win, right? It was like, oh, it's, I can see it's strategic. Uh, and it's not as honest as I would do as an artist, as a poet. But I had no poetry. And so when HBO came up, I, was, uh, I walked into the room of the first season, and the, and the pilot was being shot. And I noticed that these guys were going for each other's heads as poets. Like, everyone was fighting for that slot, right? Oh, wow. Because you weren't guaranteed. It wasn't guaranteed that your poem would get on the show. Uh -huh. So everyone was slamming against each other in front of Russell Simmons and Stan Lathan. And I literally wanted to walk out because this is not what I do, right? Uh -huh. I don't even have enough poems for this. Like, I can't compete with these guys. Yeah. So I literally jumped on stage and read a poem that wasn't mine. It was by Etheridge Knight, and it was called Shine, yeah. the Stoker. You know, uh, I, 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 let me see if I can remember it. You know, as white America sings about the unsinkable Molly Brown, tell me who was uh, the Titanic. When it, you know, so it was like, yeah. and it was just this bravado style of poetry, but I had no idea that the director 
and producer, his father read him that poem as a kid. Oh, wow. And so he, he sees this guy, and I was really young. You know, I was like, I, I, I looked extra young. I was about 21, and I looked like I was 16. <laughs> so I'm reading this poem that's been around for 100 years, and he just kind of pulled me to the side. And he was just like emotional, and then Richard Pryor liked it. You know, it's just wow. like it started getting some buzz, and he put me in the pilot. And then I became connected to the process of making this show better instead of just being a poet. Oh, that's amazing. See what happens? You know, mm -hmm. it's like he would always pull me to the side and say, man, all these poets, man, they want five minutes on stage. Lemon, just give me a minute. And I would just do a minute poem. That's that was awesome. enough to cover a time. Yeah. And it was enough for, for them to use it as a trailer. So I wasn't the best poet on deaf poetry. I was the most accessible poet on deaf mm -hmm. poetry. And that worked in the long run because I ended up with the most episodes and the most poems on that show for seven years. I love that about you because what you said, you, you were trying to make the project better rather yeah. than, than just being the best poet there. Yeah, that sure. seems like that hasn't ever failed you. Is that no. still kind of your motto? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. It's, it's like I have a solo show, but I have a director and I have a developer and I have a dramaturg and I have a, a lighting and sound guy, a stage manager and all of these people have gone to schools I've never attended. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, my director went to Yale uh, Emily went to Emerson, uh, Rob went to uh, Princeton, and so I get to sit with these guys as I'm writing my show and soak up all of the plays they've worked on yeah. and talk about what, what, was, what was good about this play and these character choices. And that also benefited me when I started to write commercials. Ah. So I, you know, I work for Nike and Red Bull and I write commercials for them, but it's always the playwright. Yeah. that goes in the room. I'm, I never get rid of the poet or the playwright. Mm -hmm. It's always with me. So my job is that I'm a poet. Yeah. I just happen to do all these other things. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, with that hard work, you know, something that I'm certainly not afraid to admit that I struggle with, and I know a lot of people in the room struggle with, is the, the stress and anxiety that comes when you care about something and when you're trying hard. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with it? You know, what advice do you have? I mean, anxiety seems like such a powerful, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about it with my students all the time, you know, and, and stress, anxiety, how that mixes with desire and hard work and how do you have, how has that manifested itself for you? Do you have any advice for, for these, for us? Well, I have a confession. Okay. <laughs> uh, I struggle with, it, with anxiety. I, I, can I read a poem about it? Please. <laughs> I, I'm going to read a poem about anxiety because I just want to be honest with you guys. Uh, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, in part of my French English. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes the poems tell the stories better. Uh, let's see where it is here. Da, 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 da. Okay, I just saw it, I just saw it, I just saw it. There we go. This one's called Nerves. <clears throat> Can you hear me here? Great. Anxiety sucks Megatron tea bags because it usually comes from the bad echoes of a driven heart, from a lawless ambition from the suffering of strong will. Life becomes scarred with walk the plank nerves even while you sleep, fighting a hereditary disorder you have to order to the corner of the room. Like a bastard son, shame, most of us have it, but rather drop a pill than drop a dime. The chemical vodka and milk mixing your brain, having a mind of their own, beating your heart like a speed bag, sparring in the ring of why me? with short inhales of Hail Mary's large betwixt lungs, and all you're doing is sitting down trying to enjoy the sun. Caffeine becomes the enemy of whatever promised land. Worry anchors you down to the moat, and its dark lake gives your steel pride a colored copper phobia. Paper bags work better than hugs. Xanax, no water, please. Prozac takes too long to kick in. Being in the emergency room is better for the lightning under your skin. The therapist who shows up too late just tells you something you already Googled and Gmailed to your journal. But be reminded in the tortoise and hare race of your thoughts that you are not the only, not the lonely. 
No matter how much even crowds of two shorten your breath, no matter how much you miss population, you have to learn to love your solitary confinement, even if it palpitates your ticker like Mexican jumping beans, pulls the cool out of you, strip searches you of your genuine smile, makes your uglies feel public, breaks down your cojones and makes them feel like lentil. Be reminded that you are normal. Your idols suffer from the same defects. It is those stubborn rattlesnakes that make their art divine, those same cryptic complexes that make up a performance and not an act, those same strategies or tragedies behind the crescent comedies that make it magic. Even the gifted are cursed. The poor in spirit, wealthy with rich flaws. Being good comes with a price. Being great comes with a bounty. You have what they call a champion sound. Being a one-hit wonder is not good for your soundtrack, so you panic with your cold snares and limited drum samples, always living like there's a beat missing called the Big Easy. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll hold on to this. Yeah. But you know, in, in the case of like, <laughs> I'm very normal, and I dealt with anxiety really bad for a long time. Yeah. It was also hereditary. Found out my mother had it, people in my family had it. Uh, and for a long time I medicated. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't like it, I didn't like the mood swings. It's when I started to practice meditation that it started to go away and I started to have a better understanding of these things are not that important to make me feel this way. And it was a process of letting go. You know, it was like, like my mother, when she did methadone, she would like try to kick it and she would go from a 60 volumes to 50, 40. I did that with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, today might be a better day than tomorrow, so I'll just wait for tomorrow and be patient about today. Mm -hmm. So, and then after a while, I just went away because my, I let, like I was so used to be feeling normal and not letting things bother me. And there are times where the pressure's on and I have deadlines and and I'm like, again, I'm still a normal human being. So some, my friend would be like, so my friend is Lin-Manuel Miranda. I don't know if anyone knows who, right? <laughs> so, so me and Lin-Manuel Miranda, I was writing a play. He was writing Hamilton. And my play did okay. It was good. <laughs> but he was with me, you know? And he did Hamilton. <laughs> and, and it was like, you know, and it was just like, I, and, you know, then there was pressure. It was like, am I writing? Should I write a musical, you know? But I had to stick to what I'm doing, what I do best. Yeah. And I was with him the other day. It was like, it was so good for him to have a friend again because his life just, he's, a, he's like the rock star's rock star. Yeah. You know, he's like, I've been in the room with him and, and like big actors go crazy for him, right? Guys who have the most attention think he's that guy. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that, there's pressure there. There's pressure when you have your peers and they're successful and you're not as successful, right? That might, or you're not as smart as the next person in the room. Uh, and you have to be, mindful of your patience and your spirit and you have to check in with yourself and that day you might not feel like it and that's okay yeah right today i feel jealous tomorrow i, sh I will not yeah I, I refuse to feel this way because that's see that's the thing we're all human beings jealousy only looks good when you write into a character <laughs> right but it's because there's truth there there's envy there's truth there there's you know truth to all these tough dynamics we have as human mm -hmm. beings there's, there's, we all deal with it mm -hmm. And Lynn, Lynn felt the same way with me at times, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I was doing stuff and, and, you know, he was just building Hamilton and that was seven, seven and a half years and I was like killing the scene, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's all, it was it's just something we have to check in with them. And I had to do that in order to get rid of the anxiety. Yeah. Just to say, this is coming from a useless understanding that, you know, it's like, oh, why do I have to feel this way? Let it go. And you know, eventually just, it never came back. Oh, cool. And I'm, I'm ready for it when it comes back to me. Oh, that's, yeah, Yeah, you're like prepared. Yeah. <laughs> one, one thing I wanted to hit on, just kind of the last hard work uh, sort of thing, is something that you mentioned, which was patience. And I, um, we'll, we'll talk about the DVD, but one of the things you say in the DVD, and I've heard you say in our conversations, is this um, sort of uh, duality between patience and hard work and success. Patience. And would you elaborate a little more on how you feel about, I think patience is something that you've, you believe in sure. and, and how that sort of works for you. Again, I believe in it, but I deal with it. Yeah. You know, there are times where, okay, you know, I'm being patient here and it's taking long. Mm -hmm. Well, I work in television as well. So when you, when you develop a television show, it takes two years. When you develop a, a play, it takes four years. You know, yeah. it depends what house you're in. And you have to have a lot of patience and other projects are happening around you. 
and you feel like you're not catching up. You have to be patient, you have to be professional, which the character in the DVD isn't patient. Lemon, that version of me was not a patient person. Which brings up a good point, yeah. which is that we were talking about the DVD and I had carefully prepared this itinerary and everything and we were talking on the phone and I said, you know, and then we have the film showing and Lemon goes, what film? And I said, your film. And he's like, you know, I haven't seen it. Yeah. And I went, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, do, do you care to comment on that and, and talk about that? Because I, we've talked about it some, and that idea of how you've evolved as a person sure. and, and, and that, that, is, um, that, 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 that you see that as almost a sure. different version of you. Yes. yes. Anything else you'd like to... Well, you know, again, I was impatient and uh, I didn't have a mentor. <clears throat> I didn't have a mentor, I needed a mentor. I needed someone like myself to show up in my life. I have a couple of actors who I work with on the set. And I have one actor in particular, I don't wanna say his name because I wanna keep our relationship sacred, uh, who I work with. And he's a version of me mm -hmm. in so many ways. He's that version you see yeah. in the DVD. Young, you know, uh, ambitious, full of fire, you know, feel like he, he, just, he just knows better, right? And, you know, it's just like being there for him. And after the end of our shoot, right, we shot the first season, you know, he poured himself out to me about how much I've helped him. And I wish I had that 10 years ago in that DVD. I, I didn't have anyone who pulled me to the side and simply say, you just gotta chill out. Is that slow what... it down, like slow it down. These, this thing will come in time. But I had so much to prove because I didn't want to be identified with deaf poetry anymore. It's like I started to see my my fellow poets on stage not being respected mm -hmm. in the world of art. Because again, real artists respect body of work. And it's like, oh, you got on deaf poetry, but what now? And Russell Simmons reminded us about that. Mm -hmm. He had warned us about that. And I don't think anyone paid any mind to it, but I did, I heard it loud and clear. Mm -hmm. That, and Stan Lathan, the director, that being on a Broadway show and winning the Tony was not even the beginning of your career. It was the precursor of what's to come. Mm -hmm. I heard that loud and clear. So the Tony Award went out the window. <laughs> and I went after a career. Yeah. And, uh, that, and at, that was the beginning. I, didn't, I, knew that, I knew that I was aiming for a career when you watched the film. I was at that point where I was like, beginning to understand that this show needs to happen in order for me to separate myself from what will eventually happen, which is deaf poetry could be a phase. Mm. And it has been. Right? We were pre-social media, and our followers compared to, had I, been, had I had social media alone, and I, and I hang around artists who have one show and have 200,000 followers, it's like, that's what they're there for. They're there to follow you in your phase, and they'll still be there, but will you be there as an artist, right? And, and that was the thing. I didn't want to be phased out. And that was the beginning of that. When you watch the film, that ambition, that hunger, living in the projects, you know, yeah. I was ready to go. And yeah. yet I didn't have a mentor to come in and say, as, as you're being ambitious, cool down a little bit. That's what I wanted to ask you that I, I definitely believe in mentorship. I sure. Mean, yeah, it's big time for me. And so that big time you for do. Me. And, and what, what does a mentor do? I think sometimes we, maybe people don't know. They think, sure. oh, a teacher is a mentor, but a mentor, yeah. what that means somebody, you're a sounding board, you're, a, you're, you're functioning in that way for this young actor, and mm -hmm. is that what you think it is? What is mentorship to you? Well, first is an example. Mm -hmm. You lead by example. I think that, and a lot of it is not just like being so upright. You can, you can be a flawed mentor as well. You know, you can like just be down to earth, and so I tend to be down to earth with a couple of the students I work with. I've been, I have, I mentor, I, if I take you on, it's a seven year gig. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in it for the long run, which is why I don't take on too many mentees, you know? So, is that the right way to say it? Mentee? Yeah, I've never I think used so. that word before. I think that's thought? right. <laughs> anyway, so yes, exactly. So like, for example, uh, I have a, a student who's now on the Hamilton Broadway show who, uh, he was a poet first, mm. and he was stuck. And you could tell he wanted more. And like he had to go through the rigor of like separating himself. And a lot of it was just having lunch with him, mm -hmm. hanging out with him, 
teaching them how to pay for checks, oh. pay for the bill, you know, like just learning the, the, uh, the like just how, how artists, I respect how they work, how, what I stole from them just in their life yeah. and how he saw that for me, you know, he saw the work, but he also saw like I had a cool little lifestyle connected to the work. I kept f good friends around me, positive friends around me. Uh, I also joked a lot, so there was a lot of humor and and over the edge jokes and comedy, you know. So it was good for him. It was like, oh man, you know, like. And then there was this real respect because it wasn't like I was his teacher. It was like, oh, he's my boy. Like, <laughs> I don't want to let him down. Yeah. Like that's my guy. And then he went to the right schools. He took the right training as a poet, and you could see the. The difference every year he would do a, a, a school uh, excuse me a, a school play right and he was just getting better and better and then all of a sudden he just became colossal that's awesome. and now he's playing Washington on Broadway that's beautiful and he's a kid like he's from like the neighborhood yeah yeah cool so, well, like, leading by example yeah I'd like to switch tax a little bit sure. and get into poetry a little more yeah. and I know that character driven poetry is very important to you is, and, yeah. and and can you maybe explain to us I you can know, explain and give examples is that, that all right? would be awesome so I love character driven poetry uh, why because it's, it's an opportunity for for people to just for, for me to like tell stories through other characters um, and uh, this book, County of Kings, is actually a solo show. It's a play. It's the only book available because we ran out of Straight Razor. Uh, and I'll give you an example. You don't mind if I get down here a little bit? Do you mind if I get down and just? I love it. Go for it. I love the theater <laughs> and the act of performing. Um, so I'm going to tell you a, a story about the Tony Awards through a younger version of myself and some other characters will show up as well. It'll lead from, it'll, it's a sequence piece. <clears throat> Would you look at that? There's so many people out there. After all the hard work, I'm finally here. The Tony Awards. Man, when they say this is the great white way, they sure aren't playing. Either they put some extra lighting out there, there's a whole lot of white people in that audience. I will cue is in five minutes and I'm finna crack this stage in half. I just wish I can go up there now because this anxiety is tearing at my nerves. I just hate waiting. Some artists suffer from stage fright. I suffer from not being on stage enough. They're rounding us all up stage left. Steve Coleman plays the hype man and yells, Deaf poets, what time is it? We all holler back. It's time to get live. It's time to represent. They announced the award for our category in special theatrical event. And I'm thinking, oh shit. Here we go with the word special again. Ooh, you're so special. In a special case like yours, today we have a special on special needs. Isn't that special? They're passing the award around, and it finally comes to me. I stare at the chromed out Antoinette Perry coin with glory and think to myself, damn, this is real. I won. I wish I could say a couple of words, but I look over to the orchestra pit, and I can see an old violinist with a permanent hickey on his neck getting ready to play right after Russell speaks. Well, whatever. I made it. And now I'm ready to shut down Times Square where they are live broadcasting another moment for us spit kings to rock the Tonys. We get to the location. Metal cranes are swinging oversized video cameras around a stage set in front of the George M. Cohen statue. I jump up on stage and the cast all smile at me. Being the only performer born and raised in this city, and in all the prayers we have backstage, this is the one thing I asked for. Tonight, the police barricades are all over Times Square. Traffic has stopped just so I can tell my story in TV timing. I'm in the heart of it all. Behind this city, there is a history of struggle, a beautiful struggle. These are my streets, my stories. How did I end up here? Staring down the fly famed fashion district of 7th Avenue, looking left to the school trips I took to Rockefeller Center. On my right, the famous arcade I played hooky at now sells eggnog lattes during the winter. I'm two miles away from the old unique boutique where my village people shopped, stomped, and housed their ways to Washington Square's cold fences. I can still smell the glazed yips rib tips messengering big checks from Goldman Sachs to the pre-9-11 postcard bomb of one world trade daydreaming of a Battery Park lifestyle. Instead, I had to put up with the punkness of a Park Slope sucker-famed repertoire. Red Hook School Zone bullying, even now, 
The bell tolls from the Yusuf Hawkins, aluminum Louisville slugger banging against a black Bensonhurst pair of balls till the sound drops out. My only year in high school, watching Abraham Lincoln crack the line of an all-city Wagner varsity defense, were off to my first thought, no memory of mine could see further past. Do you see it? The sun-drenched sight and sandy flashing lights came near it. This is where I got it. This is where it all started. Coney Island beaches, Himalaya. Millie, cause it's so hot out today. Can we go to the aquarium quicker than I could plead? She lets me have it. Ghetto Puerto Rican style. What? Que tu crees that I made out of money? Yo no sé que problema, tu sí que jode. That's why they mean Peter, because the two of you juntos, we're going to super con en la loca, you'll fail face to face. You know what they pay me? A los pelos de los panty mío, y $100 in food stamps, and they don't take that at the aquarium. And if you don't like it, get that there con tu pai, because he's a good for nothing blanco desgraciado, concho. Believe it or not, she's actually in a good mood. So that's an example of like character and poetry. Right? So, yeah. Tend to want to just step up, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's just like watching a younger version of yourself and then playing that younger version of yourself. It's a character, yeah. right? Uh, it's something I learned from John Leguizamo. Uh, uh -huh. I was a big fan of his coming up and when I saw Mambo Mouth. And then I got to see Freak on Broadway. And he was telling his story, and he was telling his story through characters. And I thought, well, how does that work with poetry? Mm. So with Millie, the mother, it's she's playing the drums. Yeah. She's like, tunku tung tung ta tunku 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 tung. You know, what? Can you create that I made out of money? You know, second problem. You know, and it was just like playing the rhythm of her voice, and that's just the style of character-driven poetry. But I think what's the most, what's you know, what's the greatest part and what's the most important part about character work is that you're able to hide your scars in them. Oh. Yeah. So I had, a, I had a lot going on in my life, like a lot of young people, like a lot of students. And I'm not ready to reveal those scars. Like, I'm not ready to reveal those traumas, but my characters can, and I can hide them in those characters, and I can write fiction around nonfiction. Uh -huh. And it helped me heal, because I went through a lot as a kid. So I tend to teach that when I do workshops. I teach character-driven poetry and how we take some real things that are happening in our life and, and put them inside a character. That way we can, be, we can be brutally honest about who we are, but if we write fiction, you'll never know what's the truth or not. Yeah. And I've, it's been pretty, uh, been pretty good. Like, you know, well, we've been working. To, to go a little bit further with that, I know um, I, my good friend Sylvia has brought some of her students here um, from the ELC program. So shout out to all of you guys who are here from ELC. Thanks for coming today. Um, and I know we have in that group perhaps some aspiring poets, rappers. What advice do you have for people to, to, to maybe go with that? You know, I mean, anything for, for young, young po or, or anybody who may say like, I've kind of always wanted to write some stuff yeah. down and, but I don't know even how to get going with it. Well, you have to be a writer. You have to be into the labor. <laughs> Again, it has to be your lifestyle. And like you, right you have day. to believe that your first draft is the worst draft. Oh. You just gotta buy into it. You know, it's like you have to write. You, you can, and you can imagine, which is great too. So you can have faith in yourself. And as a kid, I did that. As a kid, I would lock my door while my mother was in the other room dealing, you know, with her addictions and her friends. And, and I loved Michael Jackson. And I loved dancing to Michael Jackson. And I believed that I was on stage with him at times. So when the opportunity came to be, and I'm revealing a lot, sorry. But, you know. That's amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but when the opportunity came to be on stage, I've been practicing all my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, we, I appreciate you opening yourself up yeah, to that. And yeah. do you believe that, that vulnerability is something that an artist needs? Is when that crafted well, you have to craft your vulnerability. How do you, what does you that have mean? To be, you know, I don't want to see you crying on stage. I want to see the play. <laughs> you know, you have to be professional. Great. And it's good to tell your stories, but don't get caught up in it because we don't want to, we don't, you don't want, I don't want to pity you, especially if I'm seeing a piece, a performance. And it's okay, you know, if you're being honest for the first time. But if you really love this work, if you really love poetry and telling stories, be professional, right? If you have something that 
happened in your life and you're finally revealing it, maybe it's not the right time to do that, mm. right? Because you love your craft, if that's what you want to do. If you just want to express yourself, you have the freedom to do that anywhere, on stage, wherever you want. But if you're coming to me as an artist and you have to, you, you, there's a really, you've worked hard on this poem, but it's too personal, it might not be ready for me as a teacher. Mm. Because that's when I have to stand up and say, you have to be more professional, you can't cry on me. And if you cry, you have to control that so that we are all crying with you mm. and not feeling bad for you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hug you after the piece. I want you to do a great job. That's it. Yeah. That's just me. Yeah. yeah. You might not want to come to my class. <laughs> no, I want to come to your class. <laughs> Look, I've had to share. So, like, you know, so many brutal truths in the play, you know, with my mother, and I, you know, I would love to read some excerpts of that, you know. And it was just like, should I stop the play and start crying? Yeah. You know, she died on me. You know, she died in front of me. No, that has to be a, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Uh, and again, I work, you could totally steal from me, please do, because I stole from everyone else. This is an accumulation of a lot of great poets in my life, a lot of great musicians and, and storytellers who I've studied, uh, a lot of great monologue artists like Eric Bogosian, uh, Whoopi Goldberg was a, you know, I, I said John Leguizamo, Danny Hawk, they're all in here, all these artists in here, Reggie Gaines, Suhair Hamad, uh, they're all in here. And if you have a body of great artists in your, you know, in your tool box, excuse me, your tool box, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna pay, it's gonna be good. It's gonna pay off, excuse me. So loaded. All right. Okay, so this is when I found out that my mother, it was gonna be my mother's last day. <clears throat> my friend, Louis the Barber, his sister approaches me on our made up Jets versus Giants game being played on a cold April stickball street. She is crying the cry I can't cry no more and apologizing for mistakes she didn't make. Choking on the last word of every verse, she tells me, Andy, your brother Peter, just called and he needs you to go to the hospital. It's your mother, Millie. It's not good. What she doesn't know is that it's always not good and I'm tired. No weight of the world surprises me anymore. It's actually the bliss. Bliss shocks me. On my way to meet the end, her fate, the riding, the rumble of a double R train back to Lutheran Hospital with the joys and hopes of no more. No more pity. No more phone operators knowing me by my first name because of all the 911 dialing. No more Pentecostal preacher house visits like if a sickness was a demon. No more dope fiends asking me if my mother got. No more errands, freeloading, door knocking to borrow milk money from the, our neighbors. No more started to be outshined by only one more. Only one more polished hospital floor, baby blue suited nurse. Only one more Ortiz funeral home. Only one more rented suit. Only one more chauffeured hearse. Only one more day of suffering, a life I didn't want to live. Only one more dark night. Tomorrow's will be bright, all American, and I will finally live like a regular kid, you dig? And I thought that would be fact. Till in between her bedside and her life support machine lays her last supper she saved for me. Accented by my favorite full meal, chocolate shaken shore that suddenly begins to ripple like if I threw a stone in its lake. And then the rhyme screams. Seeing her so illy ill, damn on the really real, you don't know the dilly deal, all the pain I feelly feel, sugar hill, chilly chill, even though Millie Mill is suffering, a suffering so similar to little Emmett Tilly Till, and you don't know the pain I feel. Watching hour upon hour, shower upon shower of high level shook, shake seizures would devour, choking the life from my mama, my beautiful sick flower. It hurt my heart so to see her fall apart slow. You don't ever know. You won't ever know to mean the world to someone, then you gotta let her go. See, when someone pulls the unworn rug of unconditional love, the cold floor will creak, a household thug. And imagination, you know, and it goes into like this moment, right? So it's like, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm also sharing with you kind of like how I sequence work. It's, you know, because I do two-hour shows, 
uh, I take you through a rhyme scheme, then I take you through a prose, then I take you through some rhythms, you know, just to keep you in the seats. Because <laughs> poetry could be so long and long-winded, you know, you do two hours of it. And so I'm always interested in how the audience is listening and how do I keep them listening, right. which is something I learned uh, in, uh, I guess I learned it through the oral nature of poetry by Etheridge Knight, which was really fun to read. Uh, but again, that was a real dark moment in the show. And, you know, it's like, I have, to, I have to be so professional about living in the truth of that moment, but not going too far. Right. Because it's still my mother, and it's still an experience that I had, and it was torturous for a 14-year-old to go through that right. and watch this woman suffer for hours and hours, you know? So, but yet, there should be beauty there because we're on stage and people are watching and those are real traumas. Yeah, so, and so you know, when you're dealing with traumatic experiences in your writing, be careful when you, when you, you know, present them in front of an audience. Like, do your best to be a pro about it, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to take that moment to transition to, um, you know, the trauma in your life has certainly shaped your identity. Mm -hmm. um, and you've spoken about your mother, you've spoken about your father. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to transition a little bit to that last topic of identity and diversity, mm -hmm. um, we've been hearing so much about diversity in the world and, and it's, it's a common theme. We talk about it a lot on campus. What does diversity mean to you? Well, it's equality, really. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, what that, it's not how we're separated, but how, it's, it's more like how we come together for me. Because I, I identify with something called hip hop culture. And I'll, I'll explain. For a kid, I didn't identify with being Latino, even though I'm Latino. Uh, I didn't identify with being white, even though I look white. And I am white, my father is Norwegian. You can't get no whiter than that. <laughs> you know? They never see the sun, so. <laughs> but I didn't identify with that. I identified with culture. And what culture taught me growing up was that we were all part of the same struggle. Mm. It didn't matter what you looked like. And so I didn't understand racism until I started to really see things happening in the outskirts and in neighborhoods where it was predominantly white. But I've always saw togetherness, you know? And then, I, then as I became a professional, then I started to see diversity pretty much, it was internally. When it was at its worst, it was internal diversity. Mm. Because my struggles as a Latino was that I wasn't Latino enough. Mm. And I spoke for that community and I spoke for those people. And so I always went to hip hop. So when Latinos didn't accept me, I was like, yeah, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back to hip hop culture. I'm gonna go back to being the, the, the hip hop storyteller. When I always really wanted to be a part of the Latino community. My mother was Puerto Rican, never spoke English to me. I spoke English to her, she spoke Spanish to me. Mm -hmm. My stepfather didn't speak any English, so I spoke Spanish. And that wasn't enough. That experience wasn't enough because my last name was Anderson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really wanted press from the Latino community. I wanted to be a part of it. Now it's starting to change because the interns and the young journalists are now heading their own game. You know, they work at Vice and you know, they work at Complex now mm -hmm. and they identify Lemon Anderson as a Latino. Mm -hmm. Even like some of the companies I work with identify with me as the person who can speak for that community. But for a long time, so I struggled with that. Yeah, you had mentioned in our discussion this, this concept of an identity crisis and, um, and that having to do with, with being Latin enough or not Latin enough. Do you feel that it's resolved for you or is it still a struggle? Yeah, it's resolved. Yeah. You know, just now it's like the Latinos are like, can you speak Spanish? You know, they're always coming to me and asking me to like work on jobs and sometimes they want me to speak in Spanish as far as like speaking engagements and, you know, and I can do that as well. But yeah, it's gotten better mm -hmm. for me. Because only because I've, and I know it's a generational thing. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't look at diversity. I, I look at more like how can we come together? I, I don't want to see us apart. I want to see us because we're all having the same American experience, but we have issues. Mm -hmm. And we got to figure those things out. Deep issues. Like there's obviously, let, let's talk about diversity in the arts. Yeah. 
Let's have that conversation. We'll make it brief. I work in the studio. I work for Warner Brothers. I'm, I'm, I work at Netflix. And I could see why there's a problem when it comes to storytellers. Young people are not being told that there's work in those fields. Young Latinos or young people of color, right, are not being told that this is a great career choice. So then you got to catch up by the time you decide, oh, I want to be a TV writer or producer. Uh, and then you, you're, the person that you're working for, if you decide, because it's not something culturally cool to do, mm. which is why we don't have enough diversity. People, you think that there's not enough stories being told about us. There's not enough storytellers to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. So the diversity problem is not just that there isn't, like, why are there not st uh, st accurate stories about who we are? It depends culturally, like regionally where you're from. Because a Mexican from Texas is different from a Mexican in Florida. Right. And it's definitely a different from a Mexican in the Northeast, mm -hmm. right? But there isn't a Mexican writer from the Northeast. Trust me. Mm -hmm. There isn't a Mexican poet from the Northeast. Mm -hmm. They're not picking that job to tell stories. So when we, we look at our television or we look at our films, especially with Latinos, and we don't see enough of it because there's not enough writers. And if you become a writer, you have to be a good writer. Because, I'll tell you this, you will get in the door. Sundance will love you. <laughs> oh, a Latino writer? We need some more of that. Then you got to be good. Yeah. Because a studio has to pick you up and put millions of dollars behind your story. And it's not enough to just be Latino. You have to be a great writer. You have to compose really well. You have to understand, you know, like, super, super, like, drama and, and comedy, like you just gotta really know the system. There's a, there's a lot of us, but there isn't enough of us to compete. Get my point? Right? Yeah, yeah. And we need to get better at that. Like as a community, the Latinos need to grow. Like when we question something, we need to ask, are, is there enough of us to have a, a resolution to this? Right. Right, because sometimes it's just numbers. Right. I know it because I see it because I used to yell that Latino like, there isn't enough Latino stories. Why are we not? I used to talk to the studio heads and, and it's like, well, there's not enough Latino writers. You want a white guy to write it? Yeah. And guess what? They don't want to write it either. Yeah. Right? So they have that market. They have a lot of viewers watching. But who do you want telling the story? Mm -hmm. And if you don't want them telling the story, then you have to tell it. If you don't tell it, it will never be told. And is this a conversation that is happening among artists in New York? Do you feel like the conversation is even happening? Should, can, can we encourage the conversation to happen? Should we be talking about it more? What, what's a good, how do we make, make movement in this, <clears throat> in your opinion? Well, the situation that's happening with DACA, right, needs a storyteller. Oh. Because that's how the masses see story, like the world. Right. Sometimes we don't turn on MSNBC or we don't turn on CNN. Right. We turn on Telemundo and yeah. see a novella. Right. And until there's a writer who can sit there and say, because this is what the African-American community is doing, mm -hmm. they're starting to now see where there's a subject, there's a story. Yeah. Right? And this is happening, you know, hopefully with the Asian community. This has always been happening with the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. The Jewish community is like, there's a subject, there's an issue, we're going to tell the story. We have Hollywood to back this up, and Hollywood is not, they're, they're opening their doors, and they'll let you in. But now you got to take the next step and get better so that you're competing against everyone else, you see? And mm -hmm. so that's what we, how we need to start seeing it because we want to expose these issues about diversity to the world, but not everyone's watching the news to see these issues. They're watching other things. What are they watching, right? They're watching, um, it could be a great TV show. It could be a great reality show. It could be, but, but television and film, we are a huge ticket buyer. You know, we like big time. Like, you know, we buy tickets, right? We, don't, we like to watch live television still. That's the biggest demographic for live viewership is Latinos. Yeah. And imagine if Latinos were telling stories to that live viewers, right. to those live viewers, then maybe some of these issues that we don't understand because they're so cryptic sometimes, mm -hmm. we can get to see through human beings living them. That's how I watch. I mean, I, I learned a lot about the world by watching stories and plays. Mm -hmm. Plays are the same way. You should be writing plays because it's probably the, the only real position where a writer, no one will touch the writer because the writer's the top bill. And you can really express yourself on stage because as soon as you get to the studio, they're gonna, everyone's going to get in because mm -hmm. it's a production, a super production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, 
in hindsight, you know, like when, it's, when it comes to Latinos, I think we just need more storytellers. Yeah. Well, I could talk to you all day, sure, but sure. we are unfortunately out of time for really? this part. I know it went by like that. Really? But the conversation will continue. Um, we, we hope to see you at oh, the I film. Oh, I wanted a Q and A for you guys. <laughs> You've got to be there okay, now because sure, sure. if you come and you have some questions or if I didn't touch on something, come watch the DVD, see what he hasn't seen, you know, and get some questions ready. Um, that, again, is at 4 p.m. at the Sharwin Smith Theater. Uh, Lemon will be available right now in the lobby. Um, County of Kings, we have some copies here for sale, um, and I'm sure we could coax him to signing them for us. Um, Thank you so much oh, you. for all, your generosity and your this time today. No, I've great. had such an amazing time. I know mm -hmm. it's been so inspiring. Thank you to everyone who's come, and we will look forward to seeing you later today, but also next week, same time. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keep dropping the mic. That's so awesome. Oh, Thank you.